Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this is part two of our uh, lesson on the different uh, regions during the antebellum period. So we're going to be taking a look at the antebellum south and the antebellum west in this, in this second part of the screencast. Uh, so again, I want to remind you guys, take a look at the same map. America is very much being divided along the issue of slavery, and slavery is integral to the southern economy. It's also integral to southern society. So that's what we're going to kind of take a look at here with the south. Um, now, first thing just to understand here, you do want to be able to divide the South up into the Upper South and the Lower South. Just like with the North, you kind of look at the Northeast and the Northwest. In the South, you want to look at the Upper South and the Lower South. And in certain ways, they have different characteristics economically and socially. So when you look at the antebellum South, first thing you want to kind of be aware of is that there is a cash crop that is really dominating the society. Uh, and so what they say about the antebellum South is that it was cotton is king or king cotton is kind of the phrase that they use because cotton was so prevalent um, in certain parts of the South that it completely kind of dominates economically and that in turn kind of dominates and dictates the way that the society runs. Um, so this is your ultimate cash crop. Uh, cotton is actually such a valuable commodity. Uh, for the United States as far as an export is concerned. It accounts for about 50% of U.S. GDP at the time. Uh, and so like, although the South is still largely an agrarian society, they're not really going through this urbanization that is happening in the North. They're staying largely agrarian like America was traditionally, but they're still kind of uh, putting a lot into the economy. It's just a different form. They're still kind of practicing more cash crop agriculture. Now, which part of the South is really developing this um, cotton-based economy? That's really more of, uh, you know, your lower southern state. So if you look here, this is showing you where cotton is really kind of like the dominant cash crop. And if you remember in class, we talked about this region that extends from like southern Virginia and it kind of runs through, uh, you know, the Carolina through Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi um, all the way to Louisiana called the Black Belt. And why it's referred to as the Black Belt is because of the soil, how rich the soil is, and it's perfect for growing uh, rich uh, you know, crops like cotton. And so essentially, you have cotton development all throughout this part of the South. So it's the Lower South. The Upper South is more diversifying in the time period. They're still growing tobacco, but they're also diversifying into other types of crops, um, like more like foodstuffs crops, like uh, corn and uh, even wheat and growing or uh, raising pigs and cattle a little bit. Uh, and so like uh, what's interesting is that in the time period, uh, the United States in 1807 banned the international slave trade. So without slavery, you don't really, you're not going to really see this growth of the, the cotton cash crop uh, agriculture or cash crop agriculture in general. So we ban inter the international slave trade, but what happens and takes its place is the growth of the internal slave trade. So as the upper south is needing kind of less slaves, the lower south is needing more slaves. And so what's happening is that the upper south is kind of trading slaves down to the lower south. And essentially what this is doing is it's linking their economies um, through this uh, slave trading network. It's also linking them socially and it's making them political allies as well as, as a region. Uh, and so um, their economies are very much tied to one another. Um, now, as far as uh, ties to the outside parts of other regions in the country, um, the South is definitely sending its cotton to, uh, to the Northeast where you have major textile mills like Lowell, Massachusetts and different parts of New England. They're also sending it overseas to the British who are a major importer of Southern cotton. And the South tries to leverage that during the Civil War to um, gain you know, some, uh, you know, an ally in the British, which is unsuccessful. Now, this is the part of Southern society that, or the group of Southern society that's really dominating, like politically, socially, and economically, is this group called the planter class. Now, if you look here, the planter class is a very small group of people. They're about 5% of the South, and only about 25% of Southerners actually own slaves. Uh, and so although slavery we kind of associated with the South during the antebellum period, uh, it's overwhelmingly Southerners do not own slaves. Um, you really only have about 25% uh, owning slaves uh, and about 75% not owning slaves. Uh, but th that segment that does own slaves, the planter class who owns uh, you know, big, bigger plantations and a lot of slaves, they really have a, a 
dominant hold over uh, southern state legislatures, uh, and they're very influential uh, economically and socially as well. Now, for slaves, uh, slaves are going to kind of be regulated by very strict codes, especially uh, the deeper you go into the south and more of the cotton regions or the heavy uh, populated regions with a lot of slaves by these laws called slave codes. And slave codes are highly restrictive laws on, on slaves and uh, restrict their movements, restrict what they can and can't do. Um, and so essentially these are meant to kind of limit uh, rebellions throughout the South. That was always a major fear of the Southern planter class that you would have rebellions break out across the South. Um, so an example of that is Nat Turner's Rebellion, which breaks out in Virginia in 1832. Uh, and Nat Turner's Rebellion kind of strikes fear into a lot of Southerners and that causes a lot of Southern states to uh, enforce stricter slave codes uh, within their societies. Because that was, again, a major fear that they're uh, you know, thinking about potentially like these slave rebellions breaking out. Now, at the same time that this is happening, you have the abolition movement starting to develop in the North uh, and people like William Lloyd Garrison calling for slave insurrections and slave rebellions. And then later on down the line, people like John Brown, who are going to come down and try and, um, you know, lead slave rebellions throughout the South. And so, like, this is creating some tension between Northerners and Southerners or specific people in the North or groups in the North and, like, uh, the attitudes of Southern, over, overall Southern society. Now... The other region that we're going to take a look at is the West. So in the West, what's really kind of going on in the antebellum period is this idea of expansion. Okay, so the West is the new territories for the United States. And so you're looking at a famous painting that is done later in the 1870s. Um, this, the pain, name of the painting is called American Progress. Uh, but it's supposed to be depicting this 1830s, 1840s, 1850s time period where America is expanding westward. Uh, and kind of overwhelming the idea is, is of looking westward is that it's kind of like free, the mentality is that it's like free open land for Americans to kind of move into and to develop and that we're bringing civilization, we're bringing um, all of our technological developments, we're going to develop the land through farming, uh, we're bringing our religion of Christianity. So that's kind of like the overwhelming um, vision of a lot of Americans in the time period. So this is heavily tied to this concept of manifest destiny that, you know, a lot of Americans kind of believe in that it is America's destiny as a nation and as a people to expand westward and to expand from sea to shining sea. And we're going to do this through a variety of different ways. Um, now, when you look at motivations for expanding westward and kind of taking part in this, you have individual reasons to move west uh, and mostly that's driven by like desire for land. So you have a lot of Americans who feel like the East is overcrowded and they've lost their opportunities in the East and they want to be able to get a farm and develop a piece of land. So they want to move westward. Um, and that happens in the North and in the South. And one of the things you want to understand here is that in both the North and the South, this movement westward, uh, they kind of largely stay. Northerners kind of largely stay in the North and Southerners kind of largely stay in the South which extends uh, regional and sectional differences across the country during the antebellum period. Um, and then, you know, individuals want to move for all different reasons. You have religious movements that want to kind of move out west for new opportunities. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of varying different reasons for people to kind of want to go out to the western part of the United States. Now, as far as the nation is concerned, the nation is also kind of promoting this for, I think, other reasons. Um, for one, it kind of eliminates uh, our potential neighbors who could be hostile and enemies. So we have still have, you know, European powers or, um, you know, at least in the early part of this time period, European powers. And then later in the time period, other nations who are kind of bordering us in the western part of the United States. And so we want to eliminate that. Um, we also want to extend to the Pacific for economic reasons to promote trade. Um, and to potentially open up Asia. And so you see that, you know, later in the time period when we send out Matthew Perry to Japan and we're interested in talking to China about trade. And then also for just the natural resources element of this um, to help us to kind of further develop as a nation. Uh, so the country is kind of ex uh, pushing this idea and so is, um, you know, individuals are kind of interested in this. Now, kind of stuck in the middle of this whole movement of Americans moving westward are Native Americans. And we talked about this earlier that Native Americans east of the Mississippi um, were forced to move west through the Indian Removal Act uh, and subsequently the Trail of Tears when Andrew Jackson was the president. Now, 
This is happening during the antebellum period. Now, this kind of continues with subsequent presidents, and as Americans move west and we move into Louisiana territory, we move into Texas and other areas, we're going to keep pushing Native Americans off the land. And so the story for Native Americans is kind of the opposite. They kind of feel like their land is being shrunk and it's being taken away by American westward expansion. Um, and their lifestyle, especially for the Great Plains Indians, like the Sioux of the Great Plains who rely on the buffalo, um, their ability to live their traditional lifestyle is kind of shrinking as Americans are expanding. Now, uh, kind of the developments that, that lead to uh, this ability to expand westward, there's a couple of developments. So first you have the Louisiana Purchase that we talked about by Thomas Jefferson. Next you have this Mexican-American War that's fought. Our president during the Mexican-American War is James K. Polk. Uh, so you want to associate a lot of this manifest destiny, at least in the 1840s, with the Democratic Party. And a lot of the Whig Party is against, they're against the Mexican-American War, and they kind of see it as a war, they try to frame it as a war to extend slavery. Um, now, Polk is kind of advocating for extending the country all the way to the western, um, you know, to the Pacific Ocean, to the west. Uh, and so, like, understanding the cause of the Mexican-American War uh, really revolves around Texas. So if you remember in class, we talked about how Texas was its own country for a while. For about nine years, Texas was its own country. It was originally a part of Mexico, and they break away from Mexico. And then there's a border dispute between Texas and Mexico as to where the border of Texas actually is. Uh, and so Texas breaks away. They become independent. And really, this border dispute is becomes the United States issue after Texas is annexed by the United States years later um, and that's when it kind of becomes tension between Mexico and, and um, you know the United States and this eventually leads to the Mexican-American War. Now the result of the Mexican-American War is we're going to gain a huge piece of territory called the Mexican Cession uh, and the Mexican Cession you know again extends the country tremendously. Um, the, the major um, I guess uh, prize of the Mexican Cession is California. And so California uh, offers the coast, it offers a lot of rich farmland. Uh, and so Americans, uh, or at least the government, a lot of Americans are um, you know, thrilled to be able to gain a piece of territory like this. Uh, now, other effects, uh, again, you want to understand that this is going to extend sectional tension within the United States. And we'll get much more into this in the next time period when we go through um, kind of the prelude to the Civil War. But essentially, every time we get a new piece of land, it reopens the question of how to deal with slavery in that territory. So when we get the Mexican session, they're going to have heavy debates over what to do with it, because California wants to come into the Union very, very quickly because of the gold rush. They're able to have the amount of population. And so essentially, you have people like uh, David Wilmot, who comes out with the Wilmot Proviso to try and ban slavery. And this connects to the first part of our lesson, which was you know, talking about the abolition movement and the free soil movement. And this is really kind of sectionally dividing up the country. And the West is an integral part of this tension between the North and the South. Now, just kind of an ideology you want to be aware of. So this is written much later. This is written in the 1890s by a guy named, a historian named Frederick Jackson Turner. Um, but what he's kind of laying out here with this quote, he said, the existence of an area of free land, its continuous recession, and the advance of American settlement westward explains American development. And what he's saying here with his, this is known as the frontier thesis. And what he's saying is that Westward expansion and this idea of moving westward is integral to the American mentality of who we are as a people. Um, this idea that we can expand westward and we have these opportunities west, this is like a key element of what makes Americans Americans. Uh, and so like, you can kind of evaluate that on your own as to whether you think that that's really um, a major part of the American um, character back then and today. But Turner kind of makes this argument years later looking back because at that time, really the frontier in his eyes has closed. And so uh, America at that point is going to have to look in new directions. Okay, so what you should do, again, this time a little bit different, I would say to try and do similarities and differences instead of continuity and change here. Uh, you also want to think about continuity and change over the time period. But I would try and come up with a list of similarities and differences between the regions, but also connections, right? What are connections between the North and the South and the West during this time period? 
All right, we'll pick up with time period five in our next lesson.